the king had lost control of events. He was afraid for the safety of his family, so he left London and began raising an army to recover his power. On October the 22nd, 1642, the king rallied his armies at Edge Hill, a high ridge between Banbury and Kyneton. The king and the All day long, troops were arriving. Pikemen with their 16-foot-long steel-tipped pikes. Musketeers whose heavy matchlock muskets could fire a ball a hundred meters or more. Frequently, the baggage train included numbers of women and children who had followed their menfolk to war. Plough horses were taken from the farms to drag the mighty cannons. Parliament had also raised an army to defend itself, and the following day the two armies slowly advanced towards each other. Few of the soldiers on either side had ever fought in a battle before. England had enjoyed peace at home for more than 150 years. Not since the Battle of Bosworth had a major battle been fought on English soil. Most people were very afraid of the idea of civil war. As far as possible, they wanted to remain neutral and not get involved. Finally, in mid-afternoon, the first great battle of the English Civil War began. The musketeers fired volley after volley. And when their ammunition was all used up, they used the guns as clubs. With one furious charge, the king's cavalry smashed their way through the parliamentary horse. But they rode too far and lacked the discipline to take advantage of their success. It is said that a latecomer to the battle was an MP and country gentleman called Oliver Cromwell. He watched the battle from a hill and afterwards wrote that Parliament would never win a war against the King until they had better equipped and better disciplined soldiers. Two armies fought until they were exhausted and then drew apart with neither side victorious. Next day, the King's army moved south towards London. The English Civil War lasted for four terrible years. Finally, the Royalist armies were overwhelmed and defeated by the armies of Parliament. In 1646, King Charles decided to surrender and try to recover his kingdom by negotiation. The army, not Parliament, was now the real power in the land. Cromwell and many other officers like him believed that the King could never be trusted to keep any promise he might make. Cromwell saw only one possibility for peace, to charge the king with making war on his own people and to bring him to trial. The trial would take place in the great medieval hall at Westminster. Less than 50 years earlier, the gunpowder conspirators had been tried here for attempting to kill King James. Now King Charles was on trial for making war on his people. Charles Stuart, King of England, Commons of England assembled in Parliament, being sensible of the great calamities that have been brought upon this nation, have constituted this High Court of Justice before which you are now brought. 
and you shall hear your charge upon which the court will proceed. I charge that he, the said Charles Stuart, being admitted King of England, and therein trusted with a limited power, yet, nevertheless, he has conceived a wicked design to erect and uphold in himself an unlimited and tyrannical power, to rule according to his will, and overthrow the rights and liberties of his people. On behalf of the people of England, I therefore impeach the said Charles Stuart as a tyrant, traitor, murderer, and a public and implacable enemy to the Commonwealth of England. As the trial continued, King Charles refused to answer the charge because he believed that the court was not lawful. I would know by what power I am called here. I would know by what authority. Despite all his arguments, his judges found him guilty and sentenced him to death. Charles Stuart, as tyrant, traitor, murderer, and public enemy to the good people of this nation, shall be put to death by severing of his head from his body. Fifty-nine men signed the King's death warrant, including Oliver Cromwell. The day fixed for his execution was January the 30th. Outside the banqueting house, a scaffold draped in black material has been erected. A great crowd gathers. Armed soldiers surround the scaffold to make sure that no one tries to rescue the king. At about two o'clock in the afternoon, the king finally steps through one of the first floor windows onto the scaffold. He speaks to the crowd, but only those close by can hear him. He claims he did not make war on his people, but only tried to keep the laws of the country. He goes, he says, from an imperfect world to a perfect one. While some fainted, others rushed forward to dip their handkerchiefs in the royal blood. The executioner held up the king's head. Behold! The head of a traitor! Parliament refused to allow the king to be buried in Westminster Abbey, so he was taken to Windsor Castle. A few faithful friends carried his coffin into St George's Chapel. He was buried in a vault in the choir. When the vault was opened, it was found to contain the remains of King Henry VIII. So, was King Charles a traitor, a man executed for plotting against his country? Or was he a martyr? A man killed for his religious beliefs. People still argue about it to this day. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's go. 